I'm very excited to do this interview. I first, I've been a TV journalist for many years. I worked for Channel 4 News mm -hmm. and I first covered psychedelic therapy back in 2008 mm -hmm. with Michael Mithoffer's work yeah. with MDMA therapy. And so I've been watching this, this area for a long time and being very excited about it. And it feels like, I remember when your New Yorker article came out, I yeah. think 2014? Uh, 20, early 2015, I think. Yeah, and I remember thinking that was a, a really seminal moment that a writer, I should do a short introduction to you. You're, yeah. um, you're an author of many New York Times bestseller books and were, were rated one of the 100 most influential people by Time magazine in mm -hmm. 2010. Yeah, that was a joke. <laughs> but um, and it's fair to say that you're, you're a very successful writer and it's, it, it's wonderful to see a man, to, to see you go into this area. Where do you sense this conversation is at? Because I, I felt for a while like psychedelic therapy is something that, that is coming into the mainstream. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and, and on the evidence of um, uh, my book tour and the publication of this book and the response to this book, uh, the culture seems to be at an inflection point and things are changing and that there is an openness to this topic that I didn't expect to find. Um, the fact that the mainstream media has expressed so much interest in this, uh, the fact that I'm talking to audiences who are not psychonauts, uh, really mainstream audiences, and they're all ears. And uh, I think that owes a lot to the, the, the research being done on therapeutic applications. Um, I think that a lot of people are suffering out there. There's a tremendous problem with depression and suicide and addiction, and there are very few tools available to the mental health community. And, uh, and so the, the openness, hunger for a new one that might, you know, that's showing some promise is, I think, really galvanizing the interest. So if the New Yorker article was kind of a seminal moment, surely the book is even more of a seminal moment. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, you know, history will tell, but um, so far the reception of the book has, has flabbergasted me. I mean, that it's been so positive and, and that you know, we didn't know if, if your average book reader or my average reader would want to buy a book on psychedelics. People don't know how to do that. They know how to book, buy a book about food or nature, you know, the other topics I've written about. But here was one that was, uh, you know, we just didn't know that there would be, uh, people would be comfortable owning a book about psychedelics, let alone reading it. And... Uh, but it appears they are. And, um, and some of it is because it's not just a book on psychedelics, it's really a book about the mind and what psychedelics teaches us about the mind, which is quite extraordinary, and the mind as it works in, in, in people who are well and the mind as it doesn't work in people who are struggling with mental illness. Um, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, are interested for that reason, um, because they are struggling. And, uh, um, but I'm amazed also at how many people read the book or come hear a talk and are clearly very excited about the possibility of doing something they may never have done before. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, it, it, I, have a, I feel a sense of responsibility about that. But it's very interesting that people, once they read about this, they, they, ha they, they feel they have to go through a thought process. Do I want to do this or do I not want to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, I read lots of books where I don't go through that thought process. Do I want to climb Everest or not climb Everest? I don't even think about it. Um, but that's so, kind of interesting because I read Cooked, mm -hmm. your book about food, and I started doing fermenting. Yeah, so, <laughs> but that was my goal, was to inspire people to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. And, um, and I, maybe that's something about my work, that it tends to be kind of normal. <laughs> You're a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. I don't know. Um, that people do want to do the stuff that I describe. <laughs> So, but I, I, you know, I, I, the, there's a sense of responsibility that goes with that because it's not for everyone and people do run into trouble and when the drugs are used carelessly, people have, can have real psychological trials and um, uh, so, I, you know, I'm just concerned that people approach it with the kind of momentousness that I did, that it was a big deal and I was, you know, I didn't go easily into this world. I had, I had lots of reluctance I had to overcome. I, I was a very reluctant psychonaut. Because it's interesting, when I first heard that you were writing about this, I thought, ah, he must be an old hippie and he's kind of... But it, yeah. that's not the case at all when I read the book and listened no, to your I podcast. Had I had very little experience. Um, and no, I had had no major psychedelic experience. I'd had a couple, uh, I've heard here people refer to as museum doses of psilocybin uh, or aesthetic doses, you know, which are, you know, not, I mean, like smoking cannabis or something like that. Um, 
but you know, the full blown ego dissolving psychedelic trip. No, I didn't have that till I was nearly 60. Because can you tell me a bit about that? Because it's quite interesting from a cultural perspective that you didn't quite get the first 60s wave. You got more of the, the backlash against it. Is that, is that a fair summation? Yeah, I grew up, I came of age. The, the moment at which I would even think about taking a psychedelic would have been, you know, 68 to 70. And this is in the, this is in the full flowering of this panic that uh, hit, um, especially in America, but I think it was true here too. Uh, in America, you know, psychedelics got um, left the laboratory and got, you know, embraced by the counterculture, and it was um, many uh, straight people and older people thought that it was fueling the reluctance of American boys to go to Vietnam. And uh, Which it probably was. Yeah, oh, I'm sure it was. I mean, there was something very anti-authoritarian about the, the, the gist of the experience people were having. They were questioning all authorities, and uh, all games were looked at as games. And uh, whether that was inherent in the molecule or just the context in which it was being taken, we don't really know. Um, but certainly, President Nixon saw it as a big threat. He called Timothy Leary, uh, who already was like a washed-up psychology professor, he called him the most dangerous man in America because he was urging everybody to turn on, tune in, and drop out. And people were doing that. Lots of people were dropping out. They were washing up in Haight-Ashbury or going to you know, communes in uh, uh, Northern California and Tennessee. And um, it was a very disruptive time. And to some people, this was incredibly exciting. And it, and it did help create the world we live in now, environmental movement, feminism, I mean, the way we eat. All these things are 60s products. But to many people, it was terrifying. And, um, and the gap in particular between the young and the old was really emphasized by LSD, an experience that the young were having, a rite of passage the young were having that the, the elders did not understand. And that's not usually how it works with rites of passage. Usually they knit a society together. This was a weird one. Mm. Um, so it was, so I was hearing all the scare stories. I was hearing about, you know, people staring at the sun till they go blind or the guy who had so much orange sunshine, he thought he was an orange for the rest of his life. And, you know, there were like crazy stories. But there were true stories, too. There were, you know, people doing and, stupid... And true horror stories of what, what came out towards the end of the 60s as well. Yeah. It, no, the scene got very dark and sour. And, um, and that's what I imbibed was like, wow, LSD, you're, you know, you're playing Russian roulette with your brain. And, uh, and I also didn't feel psychologically sturdy enough to withstand such an assault, or what I thought would be such an assault. So Do you think you were right to think that? I think probably I was. Uh, certainly in my teen years, maybe in my 20s, would be different. Um, uh, you know, and people have asked me, do I regret not having done it then? And I don't really. Um, I don't know how things would have been different uh, had I done it. And as I say in the book, I really think they have special value, actually, when you get older. Um, you know, I see, there's kind of a throwaway line in the book that psychedelics may be wasted on the young. And I know that's unfair because a lot of young people have had very important transformative experiences. But I think they're particularly valuable when you're more set in your ways and you have all this material, all this life behind you to process and, and figure out and all these issues that have formed and your, your thought patterns have, have gotten rigid. Uh, you know, you're, in your, you're deep in your grooves of how you respond to any given situation. You have these very handy mental algorithms, but they also are a trap, and, um, and psychedelics can spring you from that trap. Mm. A sort of some sense in spirituality, at least, you need a strong ego to be able to, yeah. to go beyond it. And that's a real question about, you know, people who are 15 or 16 don't yet have a fully formed ego. Mm. And, um, and so what does it mean to have an ego-dissolving experience at that point? Um, I don't know. I mean, and actually maybe they're not having that experience. Maybe they're having a, more of a museum experience. Um, it's, it's more of an outward experience for people who are doing it recreationally. I use that word advisedly because it sounds dismissive and I don't mean it that way at all. Um, but the kind of experience people are having in the therapeutic context or in the underground guided context is a very internal experience. You're wearing eye shades, you're listening to music, you're not just getting off on the sensory information coming in with the exception of the music. Um, and that's a substantially different experience. It's a much more um, you know, psychoanalytic experience really. Um, you're, it's you're, internal. Yeah, it's internal and you're processing the people in your lives, the things you've done, your belief system, 
And I don't think that's how an 18-year-old uses it. It's interesting as well. I've heard, I think it was the Sam Harris podcast, where you talked about your sort of spiritual beliefs or perhaps lack of spiritual beliefs lack going of, into it. Because yeah. um, it's very interesting. I'd, I'd read um, Cooked and In Defense of Food. And what I found in, in Defense of Food in particular was, was a sort of mysticism of the natural world mm. in that there's a skepticism about what you called kind of nutritionism. Yeah, Divide, well, the reductiveness dividing, of science, yeah, yes. Re reduct, exactly, yeah. reductive scientific materialism that somehow removes the ineffable quality of yeah. food, for example. So would you say that's an accurate description, the natural mysticism of the, of the, natu yeah, the, mis mysticism mysticism of the natural world? I don't know if it's mysticism. It's a critique of science and, and the way science goes about understanding something like food and, and that it, it fails to see, it sees food as a pile of chemicals, which is not uh, a very fulsome description of food because food, in addition to being having nutrients, has a structure and that structure is very important. It also um, is a set of relationships, right? When you eat, you're you're connecting to the to the natural world, to the earth, to the to the species you're eating, uh, to other people. It's a communal experience. So uh, so it's an argument. I don't know if it's a mystical argument, but it's an argument for the a more holistic way of thinking about it. And I mean, people read that book and Botany of Desire and see spirituality in it. And and the fact that in Botany of Desire. You know, the subtitle is A Plant's Eye View of the World. There's a lot of imaginative effort to see things from the plant's point of view. But to me, that was kind of an intellectual conceit. After my psychedelic experiences, it became like a very firmly held, oh my God, that's all true. They do have subjectivity. I can feel it. Um, they're regarding me in some sense, the plants. So, but, but, but I think the main thing that happened was my understanding of what spirituality was shifted. I had always thought that um, spiritual, the opposite of spiritual is material. And if you believed in the spiritual, it meant you believed in the supernatural, or, or the mystical, say, which most people assume means supernatural. And I, I, I've never been prepared to give up on the laws of nature and that, that everything, you know, nature is everything that there is. And uh, we may not understand it all, but there's, there, it, you don't transcend it. Uh, and... Um, uh, but, I, but what I learned through these experiences that were incredibly powerful, and they were all experiences of connection, connection to nature, connection to people in my life, the feelings of love I had for my wife and my son and my sisters and my mother and father. Um, I realized that those, that the essence of spirituality to me, at least, and obviously it can be different for different people, was that overwhelmingly powerful connection. And that what keeps us from feeling that connection in ordinary hours and days is, um, is the ego and the defenses of the ego. Um, and the fact that the brain is tuned to novelty rather than the familiar, too. I think that hides, that hides important things from us because our, our brains are always looking for changes in the environment. Uh, as well they should, it's very adaptive. Um, but it misses a lot, it blinds us to important things. Um, so. Uh, I realize the opposite of spiritual is not material, it's egotistical. And um, to the extent you can transcend your ego, you will have spiritual experiences. Um, and they're right at hand, you know. It's just about your perspective. Um, the, there's plenty of wonder without stipulating a, a beyond. Um, so anyway, it may be an inadequate definition of spiritual for some people, um, but I, now I feel much more comfortable in that camp. Spiritual person. Yeah, I guess that you could, it's more a kind of expanding the concept of what materialism is rather that's right. than, rather than invoking it. something right. else. That's right, or, yeah, or denying it or vetoing yeah. it, yeah. That it's quite I think extraordinary. That's right. if you can be a materialist, but recognizing this material is pretty extraordinary. Yes, <laughs> exactly, and that there's plenty of wonder right here in, the, in this room. Yeah. yeah, and what would you, how would you sum up how you were changed by this journey, this writing this book? Well, in that way, that was a very important change in my understanding of what mattered and how the world worked. So that was a big deal. Um, I think as a result, I mean, the big thing that happened to me is acquiring a little more, more distance or, or fresh perspective on my ego and realizing I don't have to identify with it all the time and that it is a tool um, and it gets up to some tricks I don't like. Uh, and I don't always have to listen to that voice. And there are other voices. And um, 
Uh, that sounds crazy, you know, if you were a psychiatrist. <laughs> that's not what I mean. But um, uh, that um, there's another ground on which to stand besides ego consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that it's, it's hard to reach that other ground. I had a glimpse of it during um, at least one of my psychedelic experiences. Um, but it is something you can cultivate through meditation, through recognizing when your defenses are springing into gear, that, oh, that's what that is. Um, and, you know, there are other ways to get there than psychedelics. Um, you know, people get there through psychotherapy, but it, it happened much faster in psychedelics. So that's been really a really valuable change. Uh, if you ask my wife, she would say that I, she thinks I'm much more open, um, much more comfortable talking about emotional topics, um, less defensive. Uh, so she's she, pretty. She's happy with all these changes. Yeah, <laughs> she was very worried at the beginning that I would change in in ways that you know. She, I mean, she, she, she had trepidations about it because, you know, we'd been together a long time and here I was having a big experience that she wasn't having. That hasn't happened. You know, we had a kid together. All, all, the, all the big experiences in our lives we did together, death of, death of parents and things like that. Um, but here was one I was going to go off on my own and she was very concerned about it. But in the end, uh, what she didn't consider is that I, was, I might change for the better. <laughs> so, right. And she decided I have, so... <laughs> what were you most excited to discover during writing the book? Oh, so much. I mean, the neuroscience was fascinating to learn about, and it was something I knew nothing about. I really hadn't studied the brain in any way. I, I, didn't, I wasn't someone who read books on neuroscience or consciousness studies. Um, and, and all that, uh, what we're learning, what psychedelics are teaching us about the brain is incredible, and the mind. Um, I mean, I really do see it as a tool. And you know, there's this outrageous quote from Stanislav Grof from years ago uh, in the 60s. He said that uh, psychedelics would be for the study of the mind what, um, what the telescope was for, the, for astronomy and what the microscope was for biology. And you know, that was really an outrageous thing to say. Um, but uh, David Nutt saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Robin Carhart Harris too. Mm. And so I don't think it's crazy anymore. Um, and so it's taught me a lot about the mind. And so the study of psychedelics and psychedelics themselves are teaching us really valuable things about the mind. That was thrilling. The history was thrilling. I had no idea what was going on before Timothy Leary, before the 1960s, that there was this very fertile period of research all through the 50s where interesting discoveries were being made and incredible characters were, were roaming the stage of history that have been completely forgotten. People like Al Hubbard and uh, Humphrey Osmond. And, um, so and that, Hollingshead. What? Yeah, Hollingshead, Hollingshead uh, Sidney Cohen in L.A., Betsy Eisner in L.A. I mean, these, these names are not known to people, but they're really interesting characters doing very serious work. And it's like Timothy Leary's taken up all the oxygen in the room, and, um, and it's a shame. I mean, he, his story is very interesting, and I'm, I take pains to tell it in a new way. But, um, but the fact is, there, there are characters even more interesting than he is. And so, as a writer, I had a, a very, uh, it was a really exciting period of discovery. I mean, you know, usually when you write a book, like some chapters you're really excited about, and some you just have to get from point A to point B. I never had that feeling here. Every chapter, I was, I was finding a new world, mm -hmm. and it was an undiscovered world. And uh, so it was, it was a thrill, actually, to write. Uh, and then the trip, you know, writing about my own trips. I'd never written, I'd never, I mean, I'm a nonfiction writer. I'm a journalist. I, I'm used to working in this very tight constraint of these, this box of facts that can all be fact-checked. And here I was writing about something that was the pure product of my imagination. And I imagine it's, it's kind of what a, what a novelist does, you know, that they, they, have, they hear dialogue, they have a movie running in their heads that they're writing, writing down. And that, that may be an overly simplistic way to look at it. But, um, I, so I was in that space. And as a writer, that was, even though I had a lot of trepidations about how can you make a trip interesting, it's mm -hmm. such an internal thing. And it's, you know, isn't it like a dream? Who's interested in other people's dreams? I'm certainly not. Um, but as it turns out, it's not like a dream in many ways. It's much more concrete, uh, much more kind of narratively coherent. Um, and writing about that was turned out to be uh, a thrill. I mean, it was kind of the Everest in the middle of the book that I kept like, all right, now I've got to get to this part, and how am I going to get up this mountain? But once I found the voice in which to do it, which took a little doing and a few false uh, starts, it was... Um, Great fun. 
And whether I succeeded, obviously, is for the reader to decide. But um, so, yeah, so as a writing project, this was fantastic. As a learning project, it was fantastic. And as a personal project, I had a lot of skin in this game. You know, this wasn't a, just a cool journalistic inquiry. There are chapters that are that, but then there are chapters where I'm kind of, you know, I've got a, uh, you know, I'm putting myself into this situation. Uh, a, a situation that I had a lot of reluctance about that was um, very, and, and it was very exposing. And, and this is definitely my most personal book. And uh, there wasn't a way to do it without just saying, well, don't, you can't worry about how you look. You, you, you just have to be truthful to the experience. Mm. There's a sense as well, I mean, you, you've, you've got a lot of credibility from your previous work, from your food work. And, and I guess this area, we, we talk about kind of synchronicity or we talk about kind of there being some greater meaning to, to what's going on. Is there a sense that you were meant to write this book? Do you, do you have any, any sympathy with that? No. <laughs> um, I don't. I mean, other people could have written this book. You know, I, I was lucky. It was lucky I stumbled on it when I did. I do realize now that for many people I was the right messenger. I didn't write it thinking that. I mean, as a writer, I don't think that I have this, this bag of credibility I can bring and distribute over other topics. I feel you have to earn your credibility, your authority as a writer, every, every book, every article. You can't, if, if you just write because I'm so-and-so and, you know. Uh, you won't be that person for very long if you, you won't. use that attitude. And, and that's, that's not how you, uh, readers are not interested in that. I mean, that's speechifying, that's lecturing, and that's not what I do. Um, I started from the beginning and, and mastered this topic. But I realized to, the, to many readers, it's like, oh, if Michael Pollan's writing about this, it must not be too crazy. <laughs> he didn't leave me wrong on, on food. There was a woman, I did an event at Google in Seattle, and this woman stood up. And she was like in her 30s, you know, a coder or something like that, very successful. And she said, you know, I read Omnivore's Dilemma and I had to learn how to, how to slaughter and butcher a pig. And I had no idea as I was driving to work today that now I would have to take LSD. So, I, you know, I told her she didn't have to take LSD. <laughs> Maybe she wants to learn how to meditate. There are other, other ways to achieve these states of consciousness. But, um, uh, yeah, I guess some people feel that way about what I write. Do you have any concerns, because there is something, there is a sort of question as to whether the, the psychedelic experience is a natural fit for the scientific method or for the medical method. Yeah. Do you have any sort of concerns, there's something kind of almost ungraspable or ineffable about the experience yeah. that's, that's proven a difficult fit with both of those models in the past? Without question. I mean, how do you control a psychedelic trial? Um, can you really control it and know and, and not know who's got the, who, who got the psychedelic and who didn't? You know, some of the researchers say they've successfully fooled even their, their, um, their, therap their guides uh, as to who got the drug and who got the act of placebo. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to science in many ways. Um, and, you know, I was having a conversation with Mike Day, who's, who's uh, Mike Jay, I'm sorry, who's written a lot about this, and, and he, he believes that psychedelics have taught us more about science than science have taught us about psychedelics. I'm not sure I agree with him, but I see his point, mm. um, that you really see the limitations, and you see how limited our understanding of the mind is, mm. and that these are complicated chemicals because they're not consistent in their effects. Yeah, and you have a method that's designed to extract meaning out or... It's or limit va yeah. variables. And how yeah. do you limit... If, you, if set and setting are so important, mm. how do you assure that everyone is only having an experience of the molecule? Mm. In fact, the therapist who gave it to them, whether it was given in a chalice or in a cup, paper cup, all these things are priming the experience. And so we have to realize that to the extent that it, there, the scientific method applies, it's a little bit dirty in this case. I'm mean, not dirty, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge. To, to, to limit the number of variables the way you need to to really test a drug is difficult. Uh, and in many, other, in many other aspects too. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It's, it's the best standard or the best system we have for showing the safety and efficacy of a, of a drug before we admit it to, to modern medicine. So it may not be perfect, um, the method we have, and it may not be you know, exactly right for this substance, but it's what we have. Mm. My concern when, so I, I've done a couple, of, a couple of pieces, one for Newsnight, BBC Newsnight, maybe two years ago, was that 
I, I still have concerns that there might be too much enthusiasm. That at mm. the moment, what the, the journalists who've been writing about this and the people who've been featuring it are also, to a degree, psychedelic enthusiasts. I mean, I, I certainly was, was sold on the idea of it being positive, and there's a kind of self-selecting, we're selecting people who are already enthusiastic. Mm. So I do have some concerns that we could we oh, could we recreate, sell. yeah, oversell yeah. or recreate some of the kind of over yeah. exuberance of the 1960s. I, I detect everybody trying to keep a lid on that. Yeah. And the researchers certainly, but they yeah. feel it. You get them out for a drink or beer and like, this could be a revolution in mental health care. Yeah. And it could be, but it might not be. And you know, the fact is, it's, it's important to understand that these small trials, 15, 20, 40, um, you're bound to get better results than you're going to get in larger trials because you're getting to pick your volunteers and screen out lots of people. So you're getting the people most likely to respond. Uh, you're also, the, the therapists, the guides who are involved are very committed to the project. They're not people you took off the street and trained, and that'll yeah. be in the next phase. Um, you've got enthusiasts all over the place, and so that is encouraging positive results. Um, that said, the results were so good in some cases that even if they were half as good, it would still be better than the leading mm -hmm. uh, treatment we have for um, anxiety and depression. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I wasn't a psychedelic enthusiast when I started this. The, in the New Yorker article, I hadn't had a psychedelic experience. I was mystified by the fact that this would work um, and that, that people who were dying could actually reset their feelings about death and overcome their fear of death. Um, after a single psychedelic experience. This was completely beyond my uh, you know, sense of what is possible. And, um, but yeah, there is a, there's an occupational hazard. It's, it's something about these drugs that um, people can uh, get irrationally exuberant. And so I think your caution is a, is a really important note. And we should realize that we're really still at the beginning. And there's no, uh, you know, I can point to people who ha whose lives have been changed in very positive ways by these medicines. But whether it will work with a large population, we don't know yet. Yeah, and my, I guess my other concern would be that if we're looking at it from a strictly medical model, the idea that you take this pill and it makes you better, what... Well, that's not exactly the medical yeah. model because mm. it's... What's really interesting about this is it's not psychedelic therapy. It's psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Yeah. It's really the joining of talk therapy mm. with chemistry. Yeah. And um, so anyway, to, but finish your question. Yeah, that, that for some people, it can be a very, you can have a very transformative experience, a mystical experience that, that is really encouraging. But for other people, it, or what it can do is bring up an awful lot of suppressed stuff that you then yeah. have to deal with. There's sort of two... Yeah. That, Dep Although that can be very therapeutic. I mean, I've, yeah, I've, sure. I've talked to people who got in touch with childhood trauma that they were mm -hmm. completely unaware of mm -hmm. and worked through it. Um, uh, so that's why the therapist is so important. You bring up things like that and people don't know how to deal with it. I mean, that's why integration, that what happens after your, your, your session is probably the most important part. And if you don't integrate well, you could leave people hanging with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, real, I mean, on, with real problems. Um, suddenly this came up, you know, my father abused me. Where do I go now? This really happened? Did it really happen? Um, so it's, you know, that's part of the being, you know, treating this process with enormous uh, respect and, and caution is really important. There's some concern in the psychedelic community at the moment that there are corporate, corporates mm, coming yeah. in and most of the research so far has been done in the academic model. So everything's public, everything's published, and now corporates are starting to come in. And there is a sense of unease in the psychedelic community about that. Yeah. Do you share that unease at all? Yeah, I mean, it definitely gives me cause for concern. I mean, I think we're moving to a place where people are trying to lock up intellectual property mm. uh, in a market. And um, uh, I think the academics have to be very careful not to get ripped off. Mm. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, one of the attractions of these drugs is they're all public domain, or they should be, um, that you're not going to have the usual pharmaceutical model. Um, and in fact, intellectual property only takes you so far because you really have to figure out a way to create a whole package, you know, of, of therapy and drug and integration and the right kind of room, all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but this is the way of the world. 
you know, on the positive side, you could say that it's only when corporations get interested that you can scale this up and reach lots of people uh, and achieve the kind of efficiencies of scale. You know, so there, that argument can be made. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, my own inclination is: is there a way to do this in a nonprofit model? I mean, I think Maps is doing something interesting with a, a public benefit corporation uh, as a model. Um, but there's going to be a lot of experimentation, and no one. This is this is not an area that lends itself to monopoly. Anybody can find these mushrooms. Anyone can grow these mushrooms. Um, so, the so idea. There are companies trying to patent psilocybin. Synthetic psilocybin, yeah. manufacturing method. Um, we'll see if that works. It may not work. Um, many people have made it before. Making it at scale is is the challenge. Um, but still, the mushroom still grows, um, and it's available, and uh, not hard to find. So there's a protection in that. There's a, you know, nature is, is defending us against, nature, it's nature's antitrust act. So I guess, I mean, this, this does feel, as you say, like an inflection point. Mm -hmm. An inflection point for the public um, awareness of this kind of, these therapies. And within the community. And I mean, within the community as well. Yeah, and there are definitely tensions erupting around the profit mo model versus the non-profit model. And uh, no, I think we're going to see a lot of change. And, you know, those tensions are a reflection, though, that there's something worth fighting over. There's value here. And so you can, you can look at it as it's an index to the fact that there's money to be made here. There's which is in itself an index to the fact that there might be something of value. Michael Pollan, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah it's great talking to you.